properly. So uh, ma'am, we can start. Yeah, great. Start, ma'am. Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Tiffin Talks. I have with me a lovely panel, which is as good looking as it's intelligent. It's very rare, but obviously because it's all women, it is so. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us. It's uh, Paramita Vora, a woman I've long admired for the complete openness and the complete uh, uh, and a slight devilishness with which she approaches uh, 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 a subject that all of us are very uh, tentative about, sex and uh, female pleasure. And her Agents of Ishk is one of the finest and one of the naughtiest sites uh, uh, I've had the privilege of visiting and so much fun. There's Shaoni Gupta, who's uh, been really, I think, one of the pioneers in breaking this good girl, bad girl trope, you know, the good girl doesn't uh, have sex or doesn't ever talk about sex and the bad girls have all the fun. Her good girl, especially the really good girl, Dhamini Rizvi Roy, has a lot of fun and I'm glad in and out of bed. Uh, Nupur Asana, who's done a lot to create uh, uh, very different uh, roles for us. Uh, we've seen her doing Mutse Friendship Karoge. We've seen her doing Rommel and Rommel and uh, I keep forgetting. Yes. And, and the second season of Four More Shots, uh, which was so delightful. Anuja Chandramali, who's uh, really brought our, um, uh, you know, our. Uh, women from myths and our history and really made them come alive and made them women who, who are flawed and who are uh, angry sometimes and who are, uh, you know, sometimes uh, get sexually overheated, but they're all real and they're all, uh, you know, they could be one of us. Lisa Mangaldas, who um, does, has done a lot to talk about uh, sex and to sort of break some of the myths around uh, all sorts of things from PCOD to erectile dysfunction, and she makes it much more fun than that sounds. Mm -hmm. And Sachi Malhotra, who is the founder of That Sassy Thing, which is all about body care, and she'll tell us a lot more about it. So thank you so much. And I'd like to start with Paramita because I think she's possibly a pioneer in this, uh, getting, getting us to talk about sex and to not be uh, coy or to be, uh, to be sort of... Uh, afraid uh, of talking about it and to and discussing it so paramita you've run agents of ish now for uh, you know for about 4 years how has it evolved and what has the response been um i think yeah i mean it's uh, agents of ish is 5 years old actually and i just want to say it's so amazing to be on a panel where there are so many women who do yeah. similar related analogous work as opposed to like you know sometime back when there would just be a few people and in the mainstream, it was a rare thing to be able to yeah, be yeah. with many women doing this kind of work. So that's fantastic. Uh, I think, you know, uh, people often ask what's been the response on Agents of Ishq almost as it has an expectation that there would be a negative response. Hmm, of uh, and, and in fact, when we were going to start, like I always say that my entire career has been one of conversations where people glaze over when I tell them what I'm about to do. So I'd be like, oh, what are you doing nowadays, Paro? And I'd be like, I'm working on a film about women and public toilets glazed over. So when I was starting Asians of Fish, they would be like, what are you working on? So I'm trying to start this website about sex and oh my God, must be some boring NGO thing. That's how they would, people would think about this or they would tell me that it's not going to work. You know, people won't, are not ready. But that's not ever been my experience. I think that there are a lot of cultural gatekeepers who tell us what people, as if to say people are all one thing, are ready to talk about. Mostly I feel if you have a feeling that you wanna talk about something or you're missing a conversation, there's likely to be many more people like you. So I think like Agents of Ish, as soon as it began, I received actually a lot of love and affection and um, a feeling of apnapan and ownership. It was more like, I also wanna be an agent of Ish. I am so happy that the, the ownership that people expressed towards the project reveals that they really felt this was something that was a part of their lives that they had around them, but was not mirrored back to them in some way, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, five years down the line, I've got to say, we don't really face trolling and negativity in that way, because I think it's a very co-created space. You know, I mean, the people who are the audience of Agents of Ish are also determining what goes on Agents of Ish through the things they tell us, through the stories they contribute about their own <laughs> lives. So it's actually been a bit of a love fest. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that, sh that that's a positive experience when we think about what it is we call India today, you know, people always writing uh, very dire things on social media that though this is not the India I know and uh, the India you know is just the India you knew there's a very big India you don't know out there, 
And mm-hmm. I think we've had the chance through Agents of Wish to learn that there is an actually beautiful, experimental, open-hearted, confused, but willing to be confused in a good way towards defining some reality for themselves, people in India across different backgrounds. So mm-hmm. yes. That's so heartening, you know, because uh, uh, as you said, when you look around, you see things that, uh, you know, you don't expect from, uh, you know, a modern progressive India. And yet you say that there are people out there and a, a significant number, obviously, who uh, still think that pleasure and female pleasure, male pleasure is something that uh, uh, should be talked about, should be discussed. Sharni, what has your experience been in uh, the industry uh, with the kind of roles that you've got and making and creating a space for yourself where you can uh, be m- much more progressive than uh, maybe people uh, before you were? You know, I think either you're progressive or you're not, you know, yeah. and you, of course, evolve with age and, you know, exposure and the people you meet, uh, work with, collaborate with, but uh, you are the person you all or already are, you know, and I think uh, that has, that comes from education and the upbringing you've had. So uh, thankfully I've been brought up by uh, some incredibly strong women, my mother, my nanny, um, you know, all the women around me growing up. And then I went to say LSR for college and uh, where I also met these women who were, I was like, oh my God, you know, they're so brilliant and they're stunning and they make sense. So it was, uh, so I had a really good time. So actually after that, when I went to FTI, which was actually very regressive in many ways, mm. uh, I was like, oh my God, what's happening? But because there was a lopsided, uh, um, you know, gender ratio right. uh, in terms of faculty and students, you can, you can immediately see the effect it has on the general uh, societal or, you know, the ethos the of the place, you know, in, in many ways. And, uh, but here after coming to Bombay, um, for example, you know, right at the beginning, Marguerite, in Margarita with a Straw, I had to sort of make out with, like my, my character makes out with uh, Kalki's character. And I could, in fact, Nupur and I were doing a panel yesterday and I got told by so many people that are you mad to be doing this? Like you're playing a homosexual uh, right at the beginning of your career. It's a career suicide. And I'm like, I never understood that. And I, of course, went ahead and do, did it. And I was like, please, mind your own business. But uh, um, but even later, you know, when we I read the FOMO shot script and I, there was a time before we started shooting all the other girls, mm-hmm. there was a lot of conversation. This is before the first season. There was a lot of conversation about the sex scenes or the intimate yeah. scenes. And yeah. I remember asking my co-actor Mandi uh, that, you know, am I like, should I be responding to this or should I be responding in this way? And should I be worried? Because I'm not. Um, And that obviously comes from um, when you have trust on the makers. So obviously the makers who are, um, and the gaze has to be right. You know, I always talk about gaze. So once you have that trust in terms of how sensitive and sensible the makers are, um, and the gaze will be right, you're okay. You know you're in good hands, you know. Mm-hmm. Of course, I, I have, I don't work with a lot of people, um, especially in OTT, who specialize in sleaze, mm-hmm. you know, and that's extremely problematic. And, um, and again, the gaze is a problem, problem right? So uh, as long as I'm not being objectified in the wrong way, uh, that makes me uncomfortable, something that I won't be able to watch. Um, and it's a very thin line, you know. Uh, recently in Mirzapur, um, although I love this, I love the show, uh, even the second season, and they're all friends of the same people who made Inside Edge. There were two scenes which made me so uncomfortable in terms of how the woman who was dancing was just mm-hmm. shot, you know, and that has to do with where you place the camera, where you're framing, how you're framing, how you're composing the woman vis-a-vis the man, mm-hmm. you know, all of that and um, how, the lensing, you know, how you light the character. So these are things that you probably... Um, you know, you, you talk it out with, with the, you know, with the director or the team or the DOP, but um, so I've also worked with really wonderful people, you know, yeah. one of who is right here. Right. Uh, and the uh, Nani Bos and fantastic. Yes. People. Yeah. And these are women who are uh, extremely sensitive, you know, yeah. and extremely um, probably righteous is the wrong word, but you know, in that they, they know the right from the wrong, you know, and, and they understand that thin line between, what is ob- objectifying the body and what is not. And um, so, yeah, I, I have never sort of felt uncomfortable yet. And I hope uh, I, you know, it, that continues. Uh, 
but yeah there is a there there is a lot of um, education that needs to happen in terms of um especially when you're working with women and also children you know that's another that's right. another space i think people need to get um, a little more um um i don't know emancipated or or you know that understanding needs to come uh, through a little more right nupur i'd like to come to you as someone from lsr as well as shayani said you share uh, an alma mater uh, um uh, you know we saw bridgerton recently on netflix and that sort of mm. shook everyone up you know and i think uh, one of the reasons it's so popular is because of the way it looks at uh, i think the gaze as she said although it's directed by a man it's conceived by a woman you know shonda rhimes and there's a particular gaze to it i think although it has that very problematic uh, uh, rape scene uh, you know which is a male rape scene but uh, paramita i don't know if you're a fan but i am uh, uh, shani i don't know if you've seen it but i'm a huge fan of it and i think things like that are taking this conversation forward you know as uh, former shots did uh, so are we in a situation now where we can talk about female pleasure without uh, having to sort of uh, you know be coy about it and uh, you know uh, uh, you know we have a sanitary uh, whisper for instance a sanitary pad for instance which is called whisper you know so are we condemned to whisper about these things or can we now talk talk about these things uh, out in the open no i think paramita has been quite a trailblazer in yeah. addressing these issues and i've always been a fan of all her columns and her films and yes i think she sort of went out there and uh, you know uh, started the conversation and i'm happy that i could lend my voice to former shots please season 2 you know i think we i think we're ready uh, having said that there was some kind of a, a lot of trolling i got some death threats i think shayani did too death threats yeah i mean i she should be arrested and killed or some nonsense like that on twitter so you just block i mean you know you don't think about these things but uh, i think we're ready i think because clearly the show has an audience and who is this audience there are tons and tons of women who want to be shown uh, as proactive where where sexuality is concerned where uh, where their pleasure is concerned you know for years and decades on indian screen we were seeing we you know sex was something that was done to women yeah in a very passive kind of way and today it's sort of you know uh, um for example when siddhi's characters uh, with amit is not is not kind of sort of achieving orgasm and she's like what the hell is going on you know if i'm in it for a hook up then at least the sex should be good and the thing is that when they take when women take charge of uh, their sexuality i think it becomes problematic for a lot of uh, people we are uncomfortable with it we are sort of uh, we don't know how to you know uh, an aunt of mine in california said she was okay seeing intimate scenes with the uh, uh, western women in them Hmm. but not when it came to indian women and that made her uncomfortable so i think there is something that we so still strange. it's a, it's so strange you know we so we need to get past that barrier but i think it's a conversation it's the more that we normalize things uh in the kind of uh, uh, shows and films that we put out i think the more easier is going to be for people to accept it and you know this whole conversation about i mean there was this whole thing about uh, oh indian women are not like this this is not feminism Mm-hmm. and even what is feminism you know there are kinds and kinds of feminism mm-hmm. you know shayani and i were talking about this yesterday there are kinds and kinds of feminism yaar jo jo mere liye hai and my experience is very different from what a small town girl would be having you know what what feminism means to her would be something but i think that because uh, of uh, uh, this is reality this is uh, uh, this uh, this does exist so i think these stories are relevant you know it's not it's not uh, um, i think the conversation is definitely definitely out there and it's just going to get uh, more normalized and uh, and I, like shayani said the gaze is very important and yeah. i mean especially when i was shooting season 2 uh, for me you know it was the first time that i was shooting any intimate scenes as well so i was a bit uh, uh, stressed out myself but the thing is that i had conversation with all of these girls hmm. and for me i was like a you've got to trust me and b we need to zero in on what is the emotion that we're trying to get out of the scene it's not just two people just having sex what is the emotion behind it you know what is uh, when lisa and bani's character when they uh, you know uh, when they sort of have gotten together after uh, you know breaking up in season 1 and all of that it's not just sex it's beyond that it's something very pure it's it's it, you know it's almost like for me it was like coming together of two uh, two people and of course sex is pleasure of course but it was beyond so we need to 
you know, for when Anjana is with uh, Samir Kocher's character, I mean, for her, it's about letting go. You know, it's about breaking through a whole bunch of things in her head that have been holding her back in several ways. And and so it's th- so I was going for that, and sex was a mean, but you know, via sex, I was going to arrive at that uh, emotion. And so the conversation that I would have with the actors was very important, and the DOP about how we were going to shoot it. Samir Kochal always reminds me of Shayoni's remark on Garibo Ka Bachchan. I'm so sorry. But there was so much fun in former shots as well. You know, I think part of the joy of it was that you had so much fun, which you managed to translate on to, to the screen. And I think, you know, that whole, you know, uh, sex itself doesn't always have to be serious and, you know, wrapped in all kinds of enigma and mystery. It can be fun as well. And I think that is the joy that you uh, celebrated in Four More Shots. Anuja, I want to come to you because your women, uh, uh, you know, and uh, women in our history and our myth uh, have been quite playful and have been, uh, you know, uh, pretty, uh, uh, have led very exciting lives. But somehow that's not the impression we get. We still see, uh, you know, the Sita trope and of course, Draupadi, we see her anger rather than anything else. And we see Sita as, uh, of course, a lot of people like you have done a lot to change that uh, image. But talk a little about where we are coming from in our myth, in our history. We have some very exciting women who've gone all out, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of looking for their, of looking for pleasure. Oh, that's uh, a very valid uh point you brought up, Kaveri, because uh, 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 women from myth and history have been powerful and they've never been afraid to embrace their sexuality. And, uh, you know, it's just sad that myth and history has been uh, controlled for the longest time by a very narrow-minded group of people. We'll give credit where it's due. They did a lot to keep the myths alive, but it all comes down to interpretation. And sometimes if you're going to be puritanical about sex, which is something uh, which seeped in only after, you know, British India. Yes, exactly. So, you know, it all came down to interpretation and where a woman, a goddess was powerful and not afraid to embrace her sexuality, we started, you know, we started pushing or uh, sweeping that under the carpet mm. and you have your Sita, your Arundhati and all these extremely virtuous women who were placed on pedestals and we were asked to emulate them. But now just to give an example, if you take someone like Ganga or goddess Ganga, who's worshipped as a mother, there was mm. so much more to her than just the maternal aspects. Uh, she was um, uh, not afraid to fall in love with the mortal. Uh, she, uh, uh, Shantanu had previously been Mahabisha, a very powerful king, and Ganga wasn't afraid to break the rules and have a sexual relationship with this king. And uh, not only him, she was reborn as Radha so that she could enjoy R- Raslila with Krishna. Mm-hmm. It was a purely sensuous, romantic escapade which she needed for herself and Ganga never ever apologized for the choices she made. When the gods asked her, led by Brahma, they asked Ganga to perform penances to win Shiva's hand and she said, no, why should I do that? If he wants me, let him perform penances. So she was not like her younger sister Parvati who was a little bit more docile. We have all types of women. We can, there are many places to womanhood, so why can't we accept them all? So mm. Ganga was bold, she was brash, and I really love that about her. And I think it's nice if we recapture these myths so that, you know, we understand that our goddesses weren't just holy joes and uh, goody goody two shoes. They were like amazing. And uh, Shayani just mentioned uh, the first scene she did, right? I mean, uh, in her first film where there was a um, scene of an intimate scene between two women and I was immediately uh, reminded of uh, two uh, women from our mythology again it's connected to the Ganga story Mm -hmm. everybody knows that about Bhagiratha they Mm -hmm. know that he performed penances to bring Ganga to earth but they do not know that he had uh, that his father had passed away before impregnating his queens because he was engaged in uh, the practice of rigorous austerities and he did not get down to making a baby with his queens. <laughs> but the line had to be perpetuated because somebody born in that line had to bring down Ganga. So the gods blessed the queens and they asked them to bring forth a child from their union. Mm-hmm. So Baga refers to the Valva, 
Okay. So Bhagiratha means born from two women. Oh, so the ancients oh. were smart enough to explore all the different sexual <laughs> relationships out there. And it's very sad that today in India, for the longest time, homosexuality was criminalized. Uh, right. Whereas yeah. we hadn't originally in our Puranas, it was never criminalized. It right. never was. It was uh, accepted as, you know, uh, some uh, it's just another type of sexuality, another way of expressing yourself. So we need to understand our myths better. We need to be more broad minded. And I, I'm talking about uh, people who, you know, twist the narrative to, you know, portray all their own biases mm -hmm. and foist it on others. So it's very sad because at heart, our myths are very, very, you know, chilled out and matter of fact about sexuality and female pleasure. Pleasure in general, actually. Yeah, yeah female or male. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's why we have all these strange immaculate conceptions and, you know, people are just born, you know, they just come out of the womb, sometimes hundreds of them as in, uh, you know, as in the Kauravas and we never really find out how they got there, you know. Great. Lisa, um, may I come to you now and talk about your experience in uh, talking about sex? Uh, you know, you have your YouTube and Insta videos and you talk a lot about some of the misconceptions around it. People having a lot of information, but not enough knowledge. What is it like and why did you start it? Um, I idolize Paramita as well, Kaveri. It <laughs> makes the two of us. Have yeah, to. that um, makes a lot of us actually. <laughs> Yes, I think there's, I mean, and I've never witnessed someone who's as eloquent in both, in all languages and yeah. as full of heart as she is. And so I have to say, I derive a lot of inspiration from what she does. Um, but I also was, I mean, as a young woman navigating my own sexuality and my body um, in my twenties to my thirties, I just felt like even though I have an incredibly open family who never tried to silence or stop me and who tried to talk to talk to me about these things there was still so much that was mysterious to me hmm. um, and I felt like I have the freedom to talk about this luckily for many people the trolling starts at home yeah you know, your own yeah. father yeah. mother or father right. law brother brother, brother. down exactly. so or you know slut shame you or whatever it is so where is the option even of voicing your thoughts publicly so I have this incredible privilege as, as a young person st at the start of my career without the pressures to, you know, to either find something more lucrative to do or <laughs> not talk about sex. And I felt like uh, the investigations I was trying to embark on in my own life might be questions lots of people have and not just women. I actually think it's really important to take men on this journey as well. And obviously there are genders outside of the binary that um, I'm really interested in getting perspectives from because I'm limited by my own sort of like cis female perspective. Yeah. Um, but but I think it's been really interesting that, you know, in the, the Indian internet tends to have, I mean, the, the demographics are skewed towards men. There are just more yeah. Indian men on the internet. So I feel like if you're a content creator, you're going to have a lot of men viewing your content, even though it's ostensibly for women. And as you said, I mean, Whisper is still the name of the sanitary pad brand. I think like the the Indian woman barely has the freedom right now to openly buy pads, let alone seek information about orgasms. So sometimes, um, at least I find with my content, women are discovering it through men. Maybe men are looking for porn, I don't know, but they hit upon my content because they looked up, you know, women's orgasms or whatever. And then they, they land up on some sex education instead of a porn clip, they stay for it. And then they share it with their girlfriend or cousin or whatever. At least that's good. <laughs> So many women have told me that they discovered my, because I feel like as a young Indian woman, you don't even feel entitled to this information in a weird way, the cultural and the gendered conditioning is such that it seems inappropriate to even ask the question or, or look for this information in any way that could be traced to you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it, I, I think that uh, as Paramita said, um, you know, getting the, the, the viewer to share their stories, that's also a big part of what makes this work interesting to me because my perspective beyond a point is limited to my reality, but there are so many perspectives. And for me, the interactive quality of digital content has been one of the most interesting um, and rewarding elements of doing this because so many people just want a space to share, you know? Um, just to ask questions just to ask questions where, yeah. where they feel they won't be judged. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Sachi, um, uh, let's come to you. Why did you start that Saski thing? Oh, you know, what was the idea behind the self-care uh, products? 
Yeah, so uh, that sassysing.com is a female-focused sexual wellness brand. And, um, you know, it started with my personal struggles because I have PCOS since around 15 years now. And, uh, you know, some of the symptoms included vaginal dryness, finding sex really painful, having excessive body hair uh, in places which is not considered normal for a woman. <laughs> um, so I was bullied a lot throughout high school for being big, for, you know, all these different um, things that were still a really huge taboo and still are. Um, and that's when I wanted to, you know, actually do something about it. I wanted to create conversations, have open and honest conversations around these things that were a stigma. And um, I remember when I went to grad school, I actually did a project on a, a male-centric sexual wellness brand. And that's when I realized that this whole category, specifically the sexual wellness market, was very skewed towards men globally and in India also. So I went out there, I researched a lot and found that, you know, most sexual lubricants that were flavored mm. uh, were actually meant for men. They were made by brands that were started by men and, you know, for men and uh, primarily for oral sex and blowjobs specifically. Um, so what happens is that, you know, when you have these flavored lubes, they throw off the vaginal pH balance and they're not designed keeping the women and their uh, pleasure in mind. And that's something that I wanted to change. And that's when I wanted to make products that were, uh, you know, designed keeping humans with vaginas in mind specifically. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, like funnily, actually, I'd, I'd actually like to share the social media side of things. I know we've all spoken about the mythological aspect of it, you know, what society deems appropriate and how society reacts to these conversations. But um, the hugest challenge that I have faced as a bootstrapped, uh, you know, small business owner is that when I went to advertise for these products on Facebook and Instagram, one ad after the other was rejected. Mm -hmm. My ad accounts were blocked. And um, really odd, <laughs> you can actually advertise for Viagra, you can advertise condoms, but you can't advertise products aimed at female pleasure. So technically, <laughs> and you know, simply put, this is uh, to say that if a man really is in the mood and he wants to have it, um, but is not able to somehow, I can show him an ad that's talking about a Viagra, but when a woman wants to have it, but isn't able to easily get wet, I cannot, you know, um, target my product towards her and I can't reach her. So that's like the hugest challenge that I am facing right now. I think these policies have been designed by that men. And men. Long yeah. ago. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's a huge problem. And actually I'd love to know from you, Lisa, being a content creator, you know, how do you um, circumvent that and how do you kind of work around that or if that was a challenge for you at all as well? Yeah. In fact, I'd like both Lisa and Paramita to answer that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, uh, pretty interesting. Lisa, you go first. Yeah. Um, well, so I don't run any ads on my own content because I don't have a marketing budget, to be honest. I'm relying <laughs> on organic reach. Um, but yes, I do know that there are a lot of um, uh, sort of ad-friendly um, red tape around like, you know, if you're a company making vibrators, for example, you mm -hmm. can't advertise, um, which is why they're going to then rely on collaborating with people like me. But um, uh, th there's major red tape on YouTube as well. You can't monetize videos that are about sex. Uh, they're just automatically yeah. de deemed, uh, you know, sort of not advertiser friendly. So no ads run before the video. So even if it gets 10 million views, you earn zero rupees. Yeah. Um, just by default. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's propaganda is okay, but like sex education isn't, I don't know. Exactly. There's obviously some, some issues with the, the um, policies that are just, I think that the, they come from a place of wanting not for pornography or you know, anything that's potentially illegal in a country to be serving ads, but you, you, they're throwing away the baby with the bathwater most often. I mean, why are female nipples banned on Instagram as well, right? Yeah. There's a lot of um, peculiar and quite sexist red tape yeah. for sure. Paramita, uh, let's talk about this. I mean, uh, uh, in a in an environment that is currently so full of toxicity and hatred, you know, love is so simple and yet so difficult. Love, pleasure, female pleasure. It's so, you know, male pleasure. Uh, why is it so difficult to talk about these things? And it's so much easier to talk about uh, a hate. I think, you know, maybe, I mean, it's so interesting to listen to everybody speak because you get some diversity of perspectives yeah. on things, right? So I was very absorbed right now, but I was also thinking that 
there are yet so many missing perspectives right. in most panels that I'm on. Yeah. And uh, I think that that actually holds the key to the problem at one level, because uh, we've had, of course, terrible experiences uh, on social media with trying to promote our content because Facebook's algorithm is skewed towards uh, promoting certain uh, promoting content in a certain way organically. Like when we first started, we used to do pretty well organically, mm. but every year things change and then it becomes yeah. very difficult. And Agents of Ishq is already in a complexity business, you know, so we already have a struggle putting our stuff out there because we're not saying the easy things ever. Right. So there is that issue. But with each passing year, the so-called community standards get more and more constricting. Mm -hmm. Which is so interesting because that's not the truth of what's happening in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Going by how yeah, people are responding exactly. to us, people actually want to talk more about these things. Mm -hmm. And what I think is most ironic is that one does periodically have meetings with all these social media folks because they also go through the motions of saying that they're engaging with communities blah 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 but mm -hmm. in essence what happens after that meeting after you've like had to be fully bored with some ppt and all of theirs <laughs> is that their standards get even worse mm -hmm. so when we started out for instance we couldn't you know there's a law of the land mm -hmm. and so okay photographic representation is kind of borderline legal it really depends etc but drawings are not art is not and so we had i mean that is why agents of is also so art heavy one of the yeah. reasons was that we felt we could depict diversity yeah. in fashion mm -hmm. now the thing is we didn't grow up seeing a lot of different naked bodies mm -hmm. we didn't even grow up seeing a lot of different naked bodies of people of our own gender Hmm. And so much of our feeling of self-hate about the body comes from the fact that we didn't see diverse bodies. Right. I mean, the first time that I went to a hammam in Afghanistan, I was like, if I had grown up like this, I wouldn't feel bad about my yeah. body, right? Because there's every kind of body present and it's just people are bathing. So yeah. it's also in a, in a non-sexualized context, not about being attractive, but being human. But the thing is, if we can never change that around by new representations, because social media is going to say, this is obscene. This yeah, is vulgar. Yeah. This is promoting pornography. This yeah. is uh, soliciting sex, etc. What does it tell you about how the the body is seen? The body, as soon as it is semi naked or talking about pleasure, is put into the category of criminality. That means it's obscene, it's vulgar, etc. But nobody knows what is the definition of obscene, right? So that is why so many people have been pushing to say, hey, "Can we please talk about consensuality?" and not talk about obscenity. And so many of the conversations that, I mean, so many of the things people have been saying right now are about how sex is part of the process of becoming an adult, of expressing yourself, you know? And so the idea of pleasure can, cannot be normalized if the idea of pleasure is not part of the entire, like the entire continuum of pleasure has to be part of our, our, our worldview. But really we live in this world, not just in a society, but in a world where it's like, you have to succeed, you have to come first in class, you have to get a good job, you have to marry the right person. The world is so normative, then in, inside that little bit pleasure, 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 up and bold, you know, until the whole system changes. And why is hate so easy to talk about? Or why is there such a desire to control love and sex? Yeah. It is because people don't want you to transgress boundaries of caste, right. class, mm -hmm. and community, right? So the idea of intersectionality, until it's not present in everything that we do, mm -hmm. We're never going to change anything. We can have, we can be discussing pleasure amongst, you know, elite women. Exactly. I, elite, I don't mean well to do, but I mean upper caste and from a certain kind of background. Mm -hmm. But even mm -hmm. then, we'll not be fully free of these problems because yeah. one, we are not challenging the structure essentially. I don't think you can talk about sex in an apolitical way. Right. And I think we have to be so yeah. careful of not falling for the capitalist seduction. Yeah. Hi, ladies, exactly. we're going to give you a chance to talk about free sex. But okay, please keep, you know, prime time friendly faces there only. <laughs> and only have nice clothes and only talk about it this much and no more. The fear of autonomous women is as much as the fear of transgressing women. Right. Right. So I think like I will, and I just want to add one more thing that I also don't think that we should fall into the traditional modern binary. Right. Well, the earlier we were great and now we are awful right. okay. because yeah. I mean look at all the Hindi film songs ever they were pretty erotic women yeah. were singing them and I want to say one last thing which is that you know when I was listening when I listen to people saying that you're supposed to be the good girl or that we're supposed to emulate the good women in mythology and how I never identified with those chicks <laughs> I didn't identify with the heroine <laughs> and I'd be like the vamp is the one <laughs> she's having all the good times she's my girl you know so actually why why are women 
so scared to identify with the vamp yeah why are i mean are you that scared that a boring dude isn't going to choose you so unless you lose your desire to be approved of by men by society by whatever is the norm unless film critics stop valorizing bearded men who make boring films about women's issues <laughs> I have to say it, you know. <laughs> Unless you start adoring women, like you know, I mean, people will say things like, "Oh, Sacred Games is so great. Former mm-hmm. Shorts piece is trashy." Yeah, exactly. Well, excuse me, but Former Shorts piece is how is really radical because it's one of the few things in India where women's interiority is present. Absolutely. What women are feeling. I mean, where do you ever get to? That's always too much for people. They can't deal with it. If it's anything to do with women, it's very extra. <laughs> don't want it yeah. so if women have to be present we have to really manicure ourselves into something acceptable and that is very boring so yeah i mean i think the way is not easy forward you know much as we like to think that but it is about making choices that are not already being given to you mm. and then making of that road what you will sometimes you'll have fun a lot of the time you might not also mm. sorry Lovely. i'm more black on purpose because i knew i was going to say all these bad <laughs> Nupur, uh, do you want to take it from there? Because I think uh, uh, you must be getting this the most. Oh, for more shots, how could you? You know, uh, do you do, do you get that? I mean, all the time. I mean, my dad was like, "Ye chudele kya kar rahi hai?" <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I had to leave him alone to watch it. So, uh, our chudele is uh, posing for us. <laughs> really. <laughs> But but seriously, and uh, uh, but they were okay with say, would say friendship karoge or uh, Romil and uh, uh, Jugal. Was that okay? But uh, but this was just too. Rom- Romil and Jugal was also about two boys, two and boys. I think for people it's easier to accept uh, 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 two men in love than to have two women in love. Somewhere I don't know what that is because it's like two ladkiya unke ambit se nikal gayi. I don't know what it is. Hmm. So uh, Parubita is the best, uh, you know. <laughs> Articulate of us who can, uh, you know, uh, analyze that. So Romil and Jugal was about two boys, and because you know, there's just one kiss in that. When we're talking about actually, uh, you know, what I uh, portrayed on screen, and somewhere at that time when I was making it, uh, I really wanted to talk about acceptance and make it. I didn't want to make it edgy. I didn't want to make it uh, dark. I wanted my mother, you know, Shaoni. I, I wanted, I wanted people who think who are not very comfortable with that idea to act, start accepting it hmm. as a part of life. That yes, you know, my grand, my granddaughter could could be gay. My nephew could be gay. You know, so I wanted them to start accepting that, which is why I sort of made it like a love story in a sense between two boys. It was about. how do you get your parents to accept it essentially it was that now i came off that into fomo shots where we took that conversation further and rongita had already rongita and anu had already done that in season 1 and i you know i i was you know adding my vision to it and taking it ahead i mean to see two women walking down an aisle so to speak is just mm. such a powerful visual where do we see that in our country in romil and jugal i had to say ki ha unki shaadi new zealand mein ho gayi and now their parents have now they have accepted them they're throwing a party in india for them in their mm-hmm. adoon mm-hmm. cut to in four more shots we are showing this wedding now the nuance is that actually that wedding doesn't doesn't go on you know right. it's it doesn't doesn't materialize and that's where the nuance comes in because now we're seeing them as people you know with their complications with mm-hmm. their what they want out of life and all of that so it was not just about two women but it was about two human beings who expect something want something out of life and is this the right choice for them not about is the woman the right choice is marrying another woman the right choice but this person hmm. so i think that humanizing and uh, seeing them as uh, 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 people with the same kind of struggles emotionally uh, uh, um, it, you know i think that goes a long way in sort of saying ki ha yaar ye theek hai you know hmm. it's okay it's okay to sort of yeah this can happen this could happen in my family like in the next gen or my cousins or whatever you know so for me every time i do something for me that is the uh i always take you know slightly um people who are identifiable you know people like me my friends my family and, and then i go on the journeys with them you know yeah. their torturous journey so it was really about that right um, 
Shani, you talked about uh, the gender imbalance at FTI. The gender imbalance in uh, the industry is far worse, I think. It's a magnification of FTI, I think, to the power of 10. So how do you make your voice heard? How do you make your identity? How do you create your own identity and speak up for who you are, who you want to be, given that you're up against what people expect you to, to be or expect you to do? I've never given a shit about what people want and people expect out of me, uh, right since I was a child. Um, also, I've done, I really have been independent and it might sound untrue, but I've always been extremely fiercely independent, even when I was a child. Like, I did my thing my way. And of course, um, my mother was very protective. So there was a lot of, um, there, was, there was a period where I could not say anything and I was like, just, I have to just pass my 12th and get out of the house and do other things how I wanted. And I actually left home a week after my board exams because I was convinced that I don't belong uh, in Calcutta, uh, which is again, I felt was a very, uh, we, we call, uh, you know, PNPC, Poroninda Porochorcha, which is like, everyone's talking about what the other person is doing. And, you know, everyone's, my mother's most worried about what the neighbor auntie is going to say if I wore a sleeveless top. So uh, I had to get out of that and only because I didn't, I didn't want to think about what other people expect out of me. So I've always been that person. Um, also, I find myself in difficult places because I should be shutting my mouth more often and I'm always saying the wrong things at the wrong time. But um, actually, in Bombay, I've, um, I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of women uh, directors and in fact, Anu Menon, who was the first um, season's Season director, director, she was the 13th woman director. And again, I didn't think oh. about it. I only yeah. thought about it when everyone in the promotions went on about, oh, female director, woman director. And I was like, oh, okay, but it's not, it's nothing new. So again, from where I come, I didn't think, I didn't work with someone because she was a woman or a man, you know, but maybe um, the, the, the script and the text was, was, um, you know, was different than how a man would have written it. And as Paro would say, you know, these bearded men who pretend to be woke and write um, all about women with absolutely no idea of what women want. I have a long and, list in that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so um, I have actually been uh, able to rather work with a lot of, uh, you know, women storytellers, if I may say so. And, and it, and again, while I was talking about gays, there's a there's a marked difference between how women write their characters and narrative and how men write it. And uh, in 2017, there were some eight months I had to say no to everything that was coming my way because I was like, oh my God, like what is wrong with middle-aged men in our country who are, uh, and by the way, seven of which were rape revenge stories. And uh, they were so problematic uh, and I was like you know why do you want to go make the actor go through the same uh, kind of exploitation and I'm not really I mean of course it's fiction and you know it has no yeah. comparison in a way but I'm saying that you have no empathy you're not coming from an empathetic sensitive um, place of un you know when you really understand something you're trying to uh, recount what has happened to and is happening to women every day uh, and you want to sort of exploit your actors in the same way you know and and the narrative was so problematically written and there were seven of them that I had to say no and I was like oh my god what's what are the men reading and writing and eating you know it's we, <laughs> we are breathing the same air but why how can the understanding and the perspective be so different, so different. you know yeah uh, so and it's really something that I want to and I keep talking about it with my filmmaker friends you know and and writer friends that what is it that you uh, what that you're thinking and reading and how we are all part of the same society but how can privilege and entitlement yeah. be so strong that you start looking at human beings in a different way and it's just not about men women you know uh, also how you look at you know transgender and yeah. like you know like people of all kinds of communities you know and and what paro was saying that we have to get come away from binaries we, we look at everything in terms of binaries you know us and them it's always about us and them but we're all people and we're all different people you know and and until and unless we find representation in our cinema and in our popular medium uh, media where we can truly represent and come to an honest space where we can represent people uh, and all kinds of people I don't think we're gonna go you know we're only going in a spiral I feel right 
Yeah, uh, Paramita, I want to quickly bring you in here because uh, I'm always interested in what you have to say. You know, your work on masculinity, for instance, it's done so much to talk about the different kinds of masculinities as well. What Sharani was talking about that, you know, this kind of masculinity which tends to be oppressive but yet there are some other kinds of masculinities which are also you know which you've also studied and talked about yet they don't seem to be the dominant uh, narrative you know why is that i think you know um there's uh, there is something anuja actually referenced a little bit but mm -hmm. the idea of the celibate warrior male the one who is above worldly pleasure right that we idealized right yeah. and uh, and if, if we find a resonance of it in the way that we talk about men who won't take no for an answer mm -hmm. like they will charge ahead no matter what so this idea of the seer and the warrior and this kind of a guy uh, is so idealized right. that it's not shocking na, that when you find that, oh, all the woke guys are getting called out in Me Too's yeah. because we have valorized them for not taking no for an answer. So they're not taking no for an answer. They don't know how to hear it, right? So right. This, this idea of masculinity, it's praised in a number of domains hmm. and it becomes the only ideal. And those men who are sexually harassing women are also harassing other men. I mean, it's something to remember that they are harassing guys who are not masculine like them. Hmm. When you go into an office space, which, you know, like every time I go into a normal, so to say space, I get traumatized because I actually have sheltered myself from that ugliness to some extent hmm. by working on my own for so many years. Hmm. But what, what you do see is like multiple levels of harassment and top of that, at the apex of it is this kind of a dude. Right. Everybody seems to love to love. Which I never like that solid bormat karyar people. I don't. I. You should refuse to be bored, and then a lot changes in life. Like you, you should refuse to fake orgasms, and you should refuse to fake interest in what is not interesting. Right. They are both connected. So I think like what happens is that yes, those men are also bullying uh, men, uh, Dalit men. Right. They are bullying, pe bullying people who have accents that are different from theirs. People in offices are being bullied because they bring a tiffin that smells different than somebody yeah. else's tiffin, right? That's the degree to which these men control a structure which is potentially violent and divisive. And then women, often when they have to enter the structure, try to do it on those terms. Yeah. So it takes a long time to unpack all of that and do it on our own terms. And I think like there is we have to talk about all genders at the same time because we have to kind of change together yeah to create a world that we like more like living in more and so i also do think like you know i remember writing one column about the nice guys yeah like um, girish karnad in swami or you know yeah. sanjeev kumar often played those kinds of roles and the absence of those kinds of men like now we are kind of stuck with ayushman kurana <laughs> it's like reproductive health man, right? So every time now, once when I know the Aishman Kurana is in the movie, then I know that something's up with the tubes. And I don't know, like if I already know the meaning of the film, then what is it that I'm going to learn about myself while right. watching the film? I don't think that, you know, the way that now we are making these woke films, we're segmenting people again, right? Like girls' films are for girls, boys' films are for boys. Films about sex are about sexual issues. So that it used to call boring in documentary or in issue-based cinema has now entered the mainstream completely. And as a result, I think we're not getting to experience life through our cinema or through our popular culture. It's too much like, it's not about the experience of individual people. And I think what Nupur was saying, right? That at some level, what's powerful about the queer story in form of shorts is like you, I mean, you're like, hello, Lisa, what are you doing? Why are you behaving this way? Like when you're watching it, you're <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's like, right. you are not going to last the way you would be invested in any story of any twosome. Yeah. I don't think even with men that we are seeing on screen, like you'll have the kind of proxy interiority of a Ranbir Kapoor character in Wake Up Sid, but it's very proxy. It's not real interiority. It's not real doubt, uncertainty, emotional difficulty. I mean, you know, even politically speaking, like where your parents are being murdered in a feudal context, mm. that's a very big emotional experience that somebody goes through. But men on screen are not even going through that. Yeah. So actually, we are robbed of the possibility of seeing multiple kinds of human beings. Right. And being able to find our own way through listening to different, 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 different narratives, which, you know, mythology gave us. Yeah. We all try to do it in a different way through our story. Sorry, I went on a long time. But yes, no, no, but it's, it's about needing to like different kinds of guys, right? Because yeah. we're conditioned to only like a certain type of guy. Yeah. yeah. And then you'll yeah. be like, 
if that certain horrible kind of guy sends you an unsolicited message on Facebook, you'd be like, wow, do you know so-and-so messaged me? Yeah. And if a guy who's not so cool, you're going to say, you, how dare he? <laughs> you have to examine your own, uh, own <laughs> violence that you perpetuate in that way, right? right. Yeah. And you know, when also, you talk about make- sorry, sorry, uh, go ahead. No, uh, like just to add, like mythology gave, gave us that, even folklore gave us that, you know, and if you really went to every single human being on the streets and all of us, we at least have two interesting stories to tell, you know, and we could make amazing cinema out of that, but we are just stuck in one, you know, <laughs> through, uh, you know, hero, villain, vamp, uh, heroine, that's all. And the heroine is endlessly waiting for the hero to come rescue her. And the, you know, it's it's just so skewed. I don't know where we got it from. <laughs> I, I also want to say this binary, you know, what like now we'll flip it around. Huh. Like now the, the heroine will have vampish qualities. Huh. The hero will be an anti-hero type of person, but we don't actually question the binary and that structure. So we just keep flipping the same thing, ulta pulta. That's like, a, that's why it's become a kind of a flat omelet. <laughs> wise, because we just keep flipping it around instead of making something completely new. Yeah. I just want to add to that is that yeah. when we receive all this you know these stories i i see with a lot of women that the women have bought into that patriarchy Mm -hmm. and those binary visions so much that they themselves will doubt themselves for liking something right right you know or questioning i mean all the time and i'm like don't be scared guys just Just own it yeah just own own it yeah yeah, Anuja, uh, you've had trouble with gatekeepers, uh, with the gatekeepers of our myth and history as well, haven't you? Who've uh, wondered what you're writing and who are these goddesses? They never, uh, you know, they never sort of saw them like this. See, uh, the problem is uh, we want to believe that uh, these narratives are set in stone, whether yeah. it's history or mythology. And we don't understand that ours is an oral tradition. And over the centuries, a lot has been added, a lot has been sub- subtracted. The beautiful thing is, uh, you know, this uh, mythology, the narrative keeps on evolving. And there's always a bit of pushback because people have certain ideas about goddesses that they are perfect. The key word being perfect here, the perfect uh, wife, the perfect mother, the embodiment of virtue. And people find it very hard to accept the gray areas which these goddesses always had. And it's not like, uh, you know, the goddesses were hiding their attributes. Kali, you see Kali, she's never politically correct. She's always (laughs) topless. She's wearing a, a garland of skulls and she couldn't give a tiny rats as what anyone thinks about her conduct. That's who she is. And she demands that she be accepted the way she is. So it's just that, you know, uh, so we'll be like, okay, we'll accept Kali, but we can't uh, accept a normal woman who wants to make a film where, you know, she has to take her top off. Immediately, we feel the need to judge her, to slut shame her. And uh, again, uh, we talked about how uh, Paramita mentioned how, uh, you know, we've accepted toxic masculinity when someone doesn't take no for an answer. We have those stories in mythology where it's considered Rakshasa, Dharma, to just carry away a girl. Ravana justifies his conduct. He says, we Rakshasa see something we want, we will take it. And Krishna advises Arjuna. He says, a woman, you can opt for a Swayamvara, but a woman's mind is fickle. What if she changes her mind about you? So it's it's Kshatriya Dharma to carry a woman away. Hmm. What if the woman falls under the chariot wheels? What if she doesn't want to marry the idiot who's just (laughs) snatched her up? So, you know, we shouldn't, we should question these things because we are not living in those times anymore. So we can't embrace the past and say the past was glorious. The past was great. I will hang on to that. That's very short sighted. We need to take the best of the past and marry it to the best of the present so that the future can be even more sensible and smart. So that's the problem here, you know, so every time I tweak the narrative a little bit, you know, um, there will be people who say, yeah, you know, some people will appreciate it, of course, and there are some who the troll army shows up and, uh, of course, I always hit block, I don't um, respond to senseless hatred. If you have valid points, I will engage. If if it's just going to be like you've forgotten your culture, you bitch, then I'm like, uh, okay. (laughs) I don't respond to that. I have nothing to say to people like that. But the encouraging thing is these people are in the minority, at least where I'm concerned. Everyone, uh, there are so many young girls who are happy that, you know, uh, we are willing to rework the narrative to fit in changing norms, to say that, no, we will not keep shaking our heads and accepting patriarchy. We will not uh, keep on making excuses for stupid men who can't take no for an answer. And it's not just the women. Men also like 
that i portray my gods as vulnerable as showing fear as having a sense of humor as you know being willing to question when they when they are uncertain about the things that bother them so it's men uh, even men i'm sure it's hard on them to be expected to be strong all the time to never cry or to be you know either celibate or the or overtly sexual i would say mm. what if the guy doesn't have that much of a high sex drive it's okay mm-hmm. right it's okay so yeah. it's uh, a yeah. uh lisa um may i ask you about uh, you know the point that anu just said that a lot of young women respond to her uh, portrayals in a very positive way do you uh, you were talking earlier about a lot of women coming to you and asking uh, 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 you know questions uh, usually directed to by their uh, male uh, partners perhaps but do they come to you independently as well and sometimes men and actually one of the most rewarding types of messages i receive um are women telling me that they just had their first orgasm because they masturbated or bought themselves a vibrator or like you know watched some something that i ha- was talking about with regard to women's bodies and anatomy and the centrality of the clitoris as a reliable route to orgasm or like my first vibrator story or just my own stories around discovering my pleasure through masturbation and every and and to just receive those words like lisa i had my first orgasm thanks to you i'm 35 <laughs> never thought i'd see the day that i mean if, if i feel like i'm doing god's work you know when i get messages like those um but i think also at at one level uh sometimes i am a bit surprised at how little we we're, we're teaching young people as you know the internet has such a young demographic right sometimes i'm getting messages from 13 year olds or 12 year olds sometimes it's from someone who's 30 or 40 or and anywhere in between but but when when um it's it's the younger people who who are in school and who you you know it would be nice if this stuff was taught to them i mean even basic stuff around menstruation or so many women are it's surprising to them that they they don't pee from the same opening that they bleed from you know right. um this should be common knowledge yeah. right? but we somehow just never really taught the anatomy of the vulva most people would be able to label uh the male external genitals i feel but even women might struggle to label the the female external genitals so i think there's a lot of very basic factual information sometimes that i'm providing which is not yeah. opinion based at all it's just facts um and then the more polarizing responses come to stuff that's more personal or where i'm taking you know this is my advice or my opinion it might not be the gospel truth but this is what i have to say that's when i think maybe the responses are more polarizing but often it's just like wow thank you for bringing me this information because i just didn't know it you know yeah. Sachi, what about you? Uh, you know, yeah. what's what's been your experience? I know we've talked about social media, but what's been your experience with people who've wanted to use your product and perhaps they've uh, they've not uh, uh, worked up the courage to do so? I think you know, um, while we were researching um, the category, and you know, I was talking to a lot of women personally as well. They would come up to me, and you know. they wouldn't really know why they should use a lube a lot of women thought that they don't need a sexual lubricant i think because there's so much shame and there's so much guilt that is associated with female desire that women think that they don't need something that a can make sex more hmm. comfortable um you know that that's one because i think women are consider uh, sorry women are you know conditioned to feel that pain is part of the package hmm. right so i think making a uh, sex more pleasurable is a very far fetched conversation because a lot of women don't know that you know a lubricant is something that can enhance mm. uh, sexual pleasure itself so i think that was like an initial challenge so there's a lot of education that is required when it comes to uh, uh, you know our products as well but overall i think now that more and more women are i think owning their sexuality in different ways um they are becoming more open in in talking about it as well and um overall i think we got really really good response from women but of course there is this narrative that i think they have been fed by society you know be it like no, not getting any sex at at home or even at school in a way right mm-hmm. or having partners uh, who kind of feed this narrative further and kind of further perpetuate this um i think that kind of is something that women are are fed and um i think it's 
it's our like work to kind of you know uh, educate them in in that sense paramita for you the last word or many words um I, you know uh, may i give you the task the difficult task of actually summing up some of the things that we heard today because i think no one can do it better than you certainly not me what what uh, what do you think where uh, what do you think uh, we've learned what where do you think we're going do we do we have an idea of female pleasure can both sexes talk about it can we can we bring in the men as well the poor things i think you know can they also can they also experience what true male pleasure is perhaps well i mean i think one of the things that is very clear from the get go of today is that there are more women willing to and wanting to talk about this let's be yeah. frank men are not actually talking about sex yeah. right men are talking about the world and many other things and there's a very narrow definition of what sex is and what pleasure is that is available in the mainstream is based on the idea of very tiny percentage of men mm. and men to our condition to think that all men are the same so mm. in essence there is nothing out there and there are many women who have started this conversation there is this conversation has not been begun by men so mm. let's first of all like recognize mm. where where the revolution always begins yes <laughs> queer people queer people and women yeah. are talking about these things right and i think that is the fear the reason yeah. we don't talk about these things is because once we start to think about pleasure and choice and consent yeah. then old kinds of divisions of power and controls do not operate so easily yeah. because a lot of this is in our heads right like when when you can't <laughs> as a woman in toilet in public spaces when i was making that film there was somebody who told me yes i know there are that you know there are not that many toilets for women in public spaces and yes many of the public toilets are locked at night because which good woman is going to be out at night <laughs> mostly prostitutes so you do prostitutes not need to pee like do they not deserve to pee what is your point here exactly right so yeah. there are so many ways in which inhibition is we can't find toilet so we won't go out so we won't do this mm. or if i do this so and so will think i'm a slut so I, inhibition all the time and i think like people want are sick of it it's suffocating mm. and so there is that shift that's occurring you know as for whether men are going to catch up that's up to them like i have no i'm not such a nice person who wish to devote my life to reforming men like i cannot do so much for men if they want to come to the party it's a great party please come right but abhi munna jana don't feel bad but don't feel threatened actually i'm not a scary i'm a very scary lady bhai tere ko dar lagta to main kya kar sakti hu i'm not going to become less scary for your purposes i think there is i think i always get very uncomfortable when people start saying to take the men along who we're not stopping them they are not coming along in order to take them along what is really required it is required for us to stop in our tracks go backward and say chalna chalna so i mean i don't mind doing that in a movie song in a kind of role play situation i cannot do it in actuality i feel i feel the thing that people are doing like whether it's for more shots hmm. and i i think like uh, that's how i see thing is an amazing thing that is happening like i'm like very gobsmacked to hear about it my expression when i'm just talking i mean and, and what agents of ish did in the beginning we didn't say it but it was a queer and woman centric space Hmm. We didn't say men are not allowed, but the terms, yeah. the terms were set by women and queer people. Yeah. And it's own. I mean, we did one thing with men. We did the Great Indian Penis Survey, yeah. which we asked men to tell us what is their relationship with their own penis. Please yeah. don't comment on the rest of the world. Yeah. Even now, we do see now that men are entering that space on these terms. <laughs> they still want to tell other people what to do. They don't <laughs> want to talk about their own vulnerability, right? Yeah. but this is we are making these spaces it is really up to men to have the courage to be vulnerable yeah and mm. to step up and to and to change and to help each other to do that because there's many people are helping them but abhi all our time cannot be taken up in that we are like got other things to do so i think that i also did hear that right the stories or mean yeah. shayani is saying she's saying no to scripts yeah i also i just wish that the rest of the media and the world would learn to adore women for their brilliance yeah extraordinariness uh you know put them on the cover of magazines because they're awesome not because they're hot yeah <laughs> i mean why is it necessary to be brilliant and beautiful maybe it's okay not to be beautiful yeah. i mean it's all right why do all of you all of us are not beautiful all of us are not i don't think everybody is as smart as me it's okay i don't look down on them for <laughs> and i'm not as beautiful as other people and i don't want to look down on for that i think their beauty is their beauty i love it 
Yeah. I don't need to have it, you know. So I feel like we just need this kind of a just a more grown up, poetic, exciting life. Women are making it. We have many examples right here. People can follow it, yeah. or they can choose to be bored for the rest of their lives, like and be fighting on Twitter. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs> no one no one can say that better and for me the biggest line of the evening was munna chalona munna ko nahi chalna to nahi chalna good <laughs> thanks so much all of you it was Thank such a lovely you. discussion and i hope Thank to you. do another session soon uh, very soon thank you very much but uh, sachi Nupur, Anuja, Shani, Lisa, and of course Parumita, Paru Devi. Thank you very much. Paru Devi, Paru Thank Devi, you are making me feel oh. old. <laughs> But guys, uh, I have one request. Sure. Uh, whenever anyone, everyone's free, I just want to hang out with all of you. Like, <laughs> you're so crazy. <laughs> just, just let's hang I'm out, man. Like, this is not enough. Time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to push a mango. Yeah. I'm going to push a mango. Many people are too. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Please so make it happen, Gavri. Lots of love. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. See you.